brokenness I've got true love instead of pain and There's freedom though you capture me I've got joy instead of mourning and There's beauty in my brokenness I've got true love instead of pain there's freedom though you capture me to our worship this morning and we are super excited about a lot of things yes yeah, super excited, excited. Today. <laughs> and the number one thing we're super excited about is that we get to hear from damon curtis 
today and you'll be teaching us some awesome things. I know that Damon, Damon always does. And I also want to remind us that today is the first Sunday of the month and we have our hope offering on the first Sunday of the month. So we're super excited about super, that. Super um, excited. And then we are also super excited about a week from Sunday. It's Valentine's Day, but we're more excited even about the fact that Doug Wins is going to be preaching to us that day uh, as a congregational Zoom worship service. Wow, that's going to be super exciting. And uh, two things that I'm personally super excited about um, is the singles devotionals that are going to be going on. Um, and then there's going to be one that's with the Austin Singles uh, Ministry. And so that'll be awesome. That's mm -hmm. in two weeks. Two yeah. weeks. Amen. And uh, I'm very excited about uh, our marriage uh, workshop that's going to be coming up on February 20th. And that will be a time where we can get together. And that'll be a, a super exciting time. Uh, and then after that, on the 27th, is we're going to kick off our program called Disciples in Motion. Mm -hmm. And that will be uh, something that we can really get involved in that will help us grow in our relationship with God and with each other. And so we will give you more information about that as uh, the time gets uh, closer to that. Amen. And we want to really thank everybody in the church. Our MLK Day food drive uh, for the food pantry here in Houston was an enormous success. Amen. It was a super success. And we want to thank you for all of your generosity. And, you know, today, later on, there's something super that's going to be going on. And we may or may not tune into it. It just depends on what's going on for in our lives this afternoon. But um, we just uh, want you to have a super Sunday. Enjoy the worship. We love you all. Rest Let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you so much for today and for the time that we get to worship together with you. We are excited about the way that you have brought us together, uh, that we can use this time to connect with you. And in some way, Father, we know that uh, those who are joining us uh, online are, are connected also with you through your Holy Spirit. Be with Damon and may his words Fill us with uh, incredible energy and joy as we try to serve you. Be with our time of communions and our small groups afterwards. Mm -hmm. And Father, we just ask you that uh, you would bless this month of February and all the plans that are going on, that we can just really see you lifted up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Have Let's a continue to worship. And Super Sunday. Amen. Go Chiefs. <laughs> singing to me every nation must be saved will I hear God singing to me every challenge must be brave Quench it not too much at stay. Will I hear God singing to me?
Good morning, church. My name is Suzanne Moragan. I am a member of the Greater Houston Church here in the North Region. And I am so excited today because I get to talk about the offering. Now, there's some of you guys, because we've been literally isolated and social distancing for about a year now that haven't had a chance to meet yet. But I want to go ahead and introduce myself before I begin to get to know you a little bit more. So professionally, I am a CPA or certified public accountant, but I'm also the author of Profit First for Minority Business Enterprises. And it's interesting because one of the things that I get to do when I first start working with entrepreneurs is I ask them specifically, what exactly is most important to them? And it's kind of like in business school, we're taught in business school, revenue minus expenses equals profit, right? That is generally accepted accounting principles. That is U.S. GAAP, literally revenue minus expenses equals profit. And well, in Profit First, what happens is we twist that equation around. We literally reinvent it. We revert it. And literally what we do is we change it to revenue minus profit equals expenses. So that's revenue minus profit equals expenses. So what happens is we are literally teaching our entrepreneurs to pay their profit first. And then whatever is left over, that goes towards their expenses and everything else. And it's interesting because I think as disciples, it works very much the same way. As disciples, our biggest desire is to live a life that glorifies God. And one of the best ways that we can do this is literally to put God first. And one of the easiest ways to show that we're putting God first, to glorify God, is to give him the first fruits of our labor. And when I think about the offering, I think about the book of Genesis, and I specifically think about chapter 4. And in chapter four, you guys have read the story probably hundreds of times, but it's a story about two brothers and the two brothers' names are Cain and Abel. And they are the eldest offspring of Adam and Eve. Now, Cain is a farmer and Abel is a shepherd. So Abel takes care of the flocks and and Cain is a farmer who grows produce. And when it comes time for the two brothers to give their offering, God receives from Cain, he receives some of Cain's fruit from the soil. So he receives some of Cain's vegetables. And I want to emphasize the word some, okay? And in contrast now, Abel decides he's going to give God his best. And what Abel does is he gives God some of the fattest portions of his firstborn of his flock, the fattest portions. And now when God saw Abel's gift, right, he couldn't help himself. He was pleased, right? He was super pleased. And he began to look at the youngest son, Abel, with favor, right? Disciples, for us to live a life that really glorifies God, that means that we must put God first. And for us today, what that usually means is giving God the first of our fruits. And most of us are going to do this in the form of monetary earnings. Earnings, right? So part of our salary, that first part of our salary is going to go to God. And as an accountant, I think one of the easiest ways to put God first is really by creating systems and automating our offering, just like Profit First, right? Automating our offer. And what that means is that as soon as we're paid, right? As soon as we're paid, it's not even something that we think about. It's something that's automatically transferred out of our bank account that we've received from our employers and to the church as our offering. And the church, I love them. They make it even super convenient for you, right? They have this app called PushPay that can actually facilitate your giving, right? You can actually put your your account information in there. And each week, it'll automatically draft from your bank account what you predetermine what your first fruits would be to give towards God. And this really automates things. So you don't have to even think about it. Now you'll have to occasionally revisit your offering, right? Because jobs change, salaries change, they go up. And so you'll need to address your offering. But I urge each of you today to go ahead and put God first in your giving by exercising that muscle of automation and that automated behavior and really put God first with your first fruits, just like Abel did. Now sign up today for the Push Pay app, pay God first, and live a life that really glorifies God. And until we meet next time, live your life to the fullest, put God first, and until next time, goodbye. I'm on my way. To Canaan's land I'm on my way To Canaan's land I'm on my way To Canaan's land to Canaan
hands and
Good morning, church. I'm Damon Curtis, and we would like to welcome you to the Greater Houston Church in-home worship service. Super excited to be able to bring God's word to you this morning. Uh, if you're visiting, we want to welcome you as well. Uh, you know, it's the month of February, and it's just a lot of going on this month. It's a sizzling hot month. It's Black History Month. Uh, next Sunday, hopefully you'll join us then, is our Valentine's Day. And also today is Super Bowl Sunday, so I know a lot of us will be getting together this evening with family and friends and loved ones to be able to watch that game. And uh, I know this is going to be, a, to me, I think it's going to be probably the probably one of the biggest and best Super Bowls ever. Just seeing Mahomes and Brady go at it, the Chiefs and the Buccaneers, it's really going to be a great game. So anyways, um, today we're going to come out of the book of Philippians. I'm going to share from chapter three. And just to give you a little bit of background of the book, it's a short four chapter powerful book and uh, it's written by a man who's in prison and the apostle paul what makes him really powerful is that he's in prison he's stationary and he's not able to even travel and meet in person with people and yet he's able to connect and transfer his unconditional love and the power of christ to a people that he's not even really be able to see so right now let's jump into chapter three we'll, we'll pick up in verse one and the title of my lesson is Keep your eyes on the prize. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1 through 11. <clears throat> Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, <laughs> faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, who, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. If we desire to understand how we can keep our eyes on the prize this morning, the first thing we need to understand is Jesus is worth it. You know, in this passage, Paul is refuting all types of false teachings. Some were teaching they need to put their faith in social customs and religious traditions. And according to verse three, some were flat out putting their confidence, as Paul was saying, in the flesh. They were basically self-reliant. And Paul was like, if that's what you want to do, then we can go toe to toe. When it comes to religion and customs, I did all of that right. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee. And he was like, in verse six, Paul says, as a matter of fact, based on the law, I was faultless. Paul said, all that religious stuff and holding to tradition and lifting yourself up, he says, I consider that garbage in verse eight compared to knowing Christ. You know, Paul is trying to help the church here as well as us, I believe, help them see that they need to get rid of the religion so they can get back focused on the relationship. You know, Paul is saying Jesus is worth it. And he's teaching us that Jesus is more valuable than holding to religions, religious traditions and customs of the day. You know, I'm not saying we need to stop coming to church. You know, we need to still be on church service here today. <clears throat> I'm not saying we need to not take communion. I'm not saying we don't need to still join up in our small groups on Wednesday, Wednesdays and be able to uh, give to and serve the poor and give our tithes and offerings. I'm not saying we need to stop doing those things. But those, what I am saying is those things are to help us keep our eyes on Jesus. Those things are to help us stay connected to each other as a body of Christ. To continue to be a light to the world. 
And we have to make sure our religion and our traditions doesn't become our guide because God is so much bigger than our customs and our traditions of the day. You know, in a diverse church the size of ours, I'm sure we all have a lot of opinions like myself. And we have to make sure because of that, we stay close to God so we can stay humble and we can be in step with the spirit. So when the spirit is calling us to pivot and change and do things a certain way, we got to be able to be humble and work together. You know, one of the things I'm so excited about in the church in the next few weeks, God has put on the hearts of the leadership team and the elders that we we go through a new edition of Kit Cummings book called 40 Days of Prayer, Steps to Spiritual a Spiritual Breakthrough. And I'm excited about that because prayer is what gives us clarity and reminds us that Jesus is worth so much more because it's so easy to get our minds wrapped around all this garbage we see in social media and on the news today and on the radio. As Paul would say, it's garbage compared to knowing Christ. So let me ask you a question. How how do you identify yourself? Where, Where do you go to draw strength? I mean, I know for me, it's just so easy to get strength from so many things. Isn't it easy for us to get get our identity from our clothes and our, our, our complexion, our skin, our body, the car we drive, the home we live in, the, our, our name, uh, our lineage, where we came from, the city, the country, the island we came from. It's so easy to, to get our identity from so many things. We can even get our identity from from sports figures and and some sports teams and knowing all the stats of sports. You know, Um, I think it's kind of cool that tonight is the Super Bowl Sunday and I hope you get to have a great time. You know, it is one of the most favorite watched, most high, high rate, highly rated uh, uh, event that a lot of people watch of the year. Tonight will be like over 100 million people viewing. We'll see about 130 countries tuning in, uh, listening in from 30 different languages. Those things are exciting and those things are really cool. But Paul is saying the most important identity we need to be concerned about is the one we have in Jesus. As a matter of fact, let's see what he says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 28. He says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized in Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there a male and female, for you are all one in Christ. Is Jesus not worth it? Is he not above all things that we define ourselves by? Let's keep reading. Philippians chapter 3, and we'll pick up in verse 12. Paul says, not that I have already obtained all this, I have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things And if on some point you think differently, that too, God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Point number one, Jesus is worth it. And point number two, you can move through it. You know, Paul is teaching us that what actual spiritual maturity is. And we see that in verse 12. He says, uh, spiritual maturity is not perfection. And we know that because Paul says, listen to what he says. He says, not that I have already obtained it or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on, meaning there's a constant focus on growing and straining ahead and making small nudge moves forward. And in verse 12, doesn't mean you no longer forget about your past. Sometimes we go through things and we can easily forget about things, even some traumatic things, forgetting, forget as if it never happened. But there are some things in life that we go through and it's just hard to shake. And we can forgive, but it's hard to forget. And I think also it's easy for us to put timetables on things. And you know what? God, only God is in charge of putting a time on things. He's in charge of time, not us. Some things can take days, weeks, months, possibly years to really work through. You know, sometimes it's just easy to feel like we're stuck, right? 
Have you ever felt that way? You know, here's an image of a young lady named Miss Claudette Colvin. 15-year-old teenager at the time who went to Booker T. Washington High School in Montgomery, Alabama. And she was the catalyst, a lot of people don't know this, for starting the civil rights movement. People know the heroic uh, story of Rosa Parks, but they don't realize that this teenager was the behind the scene instigator of the civil rights movement. And she's the one who actually inspired Rosa Parks and Fred Gray, who was a civil rights lawyer for Martin Luther King and for Rosa and for Claudette. She was the one who inspired them to do what they did. You know, the black community of the 1950s was stuck by being segregated on city buses until Ms. Claudette Colvin came along. She was right on the bus in Montgomery, Alabama, and the bus driver told her to give up her seat to a white patron, and she refused, and she was arrested. And you know what? A teenage girl was the test case to end segregation on the buses in 1956 in the Supreme Court's favor. You know, if you're a teen or you're a young teen or maybe even a college student or even a young professional, if you're watching this morning, I want to urge you and I beg you to not let anyone look down on you because you are young, but to set an example for the believers in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Ms. Colvin, just like the Apostle Paul, is reminding us we don't have to stay stuck and be stay captive to our past. In Christ and through Christ, we can move through whatever together as a band of brothers and sisters. You know, let me ask you, do you need to forgive anybody? Or, or are you waiting for someone uh, to give you an apology about something? You know, the good news is, is you don't have to wait for an apology. As a matter of fact, Proverbs 19.11 says, a person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. You know, the absolute greatest example of overlooking an offense without an apology is Jesus as he hung on the cross. Jesus is worth it. I hope you see that. And we see uh, you can move through it. And lastly, let us move beyond it. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 through 21. Join together and following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is their destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is to their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Jesus is worth it. You can move through it. And finally, let us move beyond it. You know, there are so many people who have zero interest on this earth to be spiritual beings. And that breaks my heart. And we see it breaks the heart of Paul here. And we see in verse 18, he mentions it brings him to tears that many live as enemies of the cross. But he also shares that because he wants to make sure he, they don't let this bring them down. He wants them to know that they will see even greater things, that they will see. He wants them to see beyond this. And Paul says in Philippians 4, verse 1, he says to stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. And here in this chapter, in Philippians uh, chapter 3, verse 20, he says our citizenship is in heaven. He's trying to help them see beyond their temporary circumstances. And in verse 21, he says the power of Jesus brings everything under his control. So Paul's not ignoring that this current life will bring a lot of heartache and challenges, but he's helping them understand that we can stand firm and see beyond it because we will know there's something better on the other side. You know, before we close out this morning, I want to kind of share a powerful, powerful story of a young man 
who I would say is the epitome of someone that saw beyond his circumstances. His name is Inky Johnson. And Inky Johnson played safety for Tennessee Volunteers, number 29. And uh, he had his college career ended, though, in uh, 2006. And he was projected to go in the first round draft pick and probably in the first 30 that would be picked in the first round. But the dream got evaporated pretty quick when Johnson suffered a life-threatening injury, which ruptured an artery in his chest and left his right arm paralyzed. Everything in his life, growing up in a two-bedroom apartment with 13 people in that small apartment, evolved around him one day going to the NFL. Inky, you know, was, when he got injured, was just 10 games away from going into the first round draft pick. Headline said it all, the radio said it all, ESPN said it all. He was projected just 10 games away to go into the NFL. And I wanna share with you a quote that he said. He said, Inky said, from the age of seven years old to 20 years old, boiled down to one moment. And the next morning when I woke up from that surgery, the NFL on my scale of life was that big. SEC championship, <laughs> that big. Being a cornerback and a safety, <laughs> that big. Can you handle things when God redirects your course? Some of the things we go through in life, there is not a scripture for it. But this is what I've come to understand. In life, some people don't need you to preach a sermon. They need you to live one. So when they see you living it, they can connect and identify with that. One thing I ask you, as powerful, talented, and beautiful as you are, never allow life make you forget why you started living in the first place. I've heard a lot of people tell me, Inky, I want to give my life to Christ, not because of what happened to me, but because of what I've seen happen to you. So when ESPN, so when ESPN comes to me and says, Ink, you wouldn't want to be in the NFL right now? And I say, if you only knew, my father got saved because of my injury. If you only knew, my three boys who are all in the NFL got saved because of my injury. If you only knew, my mother and the love of her faith. If you only knew. I just saw God do so many things from the injury. And I'm like, every day I wake up, I just try to stay out of his way. I'm going to leave you with this. We all know what to do when God says yes. We all know what to do when we get blessed. We already know what to do when our prayers get answered. But the question I have for you, and it's rhetorical, what will you do when God says no. <laughs> it's so easy for us, church, to get wrapped up in the things of this life and this world. This place is our temporary tent. We have to remember we go through this life, but it's not the end result. We are citizens of heaven, Paul says. That's where we need to wrap our heads and our minds around. You know, let me close out with these powerful words of Paul from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though hourly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, Greater Houston Church, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Jesus is worth it. You can move through it and let us see beyond it. And church, may we all keep our eyes on the prize. God bless you. Have a great communion service and have a great time watching the Super Bowl. We'll see you next week. Thank you, Damon, for this inspiring message and for inviting us to share our thoughts. I'm Jorge Chiriboga, and this is my wife, Susana. What I love about today's message is that God encourages me not to get stuck on the problems of today, 
I can personally get distracted with both my job and especially the political news of the day. Our country has gone through so much right now, and you know it's not over. But Paul reminds me to forget these momentary troubles, keep my eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, that Jesus is worth the price to keep moving through this and to look far beyond of what's seen today. It is not easy. It demands denying myself and to avoid being caught up in the moment. Paul called these moments light and momentary troubles. Honestly, they seem bigger than that to me, but I have to remind myself that Jesus is in control of everything and that I belong to heaven and not to the events of this world. As for me, I can often struggle with identity issues and even get my security at times from religious acts and good deeds. But Paul's words remind me that nothing is more important than simply my relationship with Jesus and getting to know Him more and more. So it's really good to be reminded of who I am in Christ. And why would I settle for lesser things when it's an amazing privilege to know Christ on this earth and to have a citizenship awaiting me in heaven? Keeping my eyes on the prize, especially during tough times, means moving beyond challenges by forgiving others or even forgiving myself getting back up again, and pressing on toward my goal. And even if God says no to an important prayer, that I will not lose heart and fix my eyes again on Jesus and one day be with Him forever. Thank you for letting us share and have a great day in the Lord.